We're going to talk today about uh, growing strong in the seasons of life. I don't know why it is, but I'm about to turn 59 this summer, and I've just become more reflective as I realize my 60s are around the corner, that just life is kind of looking a little different to me. I'm no longer in this realm of middle age, unless I want to live to 120. I don't think that's going to happen. I'm more aware of when people pass in this life, what age they are when they, they pass, uh, though I don't really read the obituary section regularly. Um, I become more in tune to the passing of people and more recognizing, not in a gloomy sense in any way, uh, or a melancholy sense, but just in a sense that uh, the, the years I have on this earth, based on actuary tables of life expectancy, um, are more limited uh, than they are in number. Uh, there was a time in my life where I saw a great big life ahead of me and um, never thought at all about passing or life being valuable. I was just living life, enjoying it, and, and kind of like Audrey and Oliver, you're just ready to go on to the next step, whether it be graduating from middle school, high school, get my driver's license, going to college, getting married, things like that, always looking ahead and realize that there's good things coming. But now I'm looking more at this life is uh, precious, every day should matter and that there's a great day coming, and that ultimately God's eternal destiny will be lived out in my life, but here on this earth, things are somewhat limited. So I've kind of tried to reflect in my own personal studies and decided in this lesson, maybe one more, and kind of did a little bit in last week's Mother's Day lesson, just to reflect on life itself. If you know me, you know I like looking at the big picture of things. Um, and I think if we look at life through seasons, as many people have done, there have been books on this where... People have matched our life periods to the seasons uh, that we go through um, here on this planet and made connections. I want to try to do that uh, today to help us value our life more and to appreciate each time period that we live in. Because there are no wasted time periods. It's not like you turn 21 and all of a sudden everything gets big for you or 25 or things like that. Nor have things ended for you when you turn 70 or anything like that. Every period of life has a reason, a purpose, and a value to you, and you are continuously valuable to someone else, no matter how young you are or how older you get. Let's just go right through these seasons. We'll spend time with each one and try to appreciate and value them. First of all, the, the season of youth, ages 0 to 13. I just kind of came up with these years. I didn't consult science or anything. I just looked at life as a kind of a teacher, as a dad, and things like that. Here's kind of this, those distinctive time periods. Uh, spring would be an apt way to describe our time from ages zero, that is coming out in birth, till about our early teenage years. In springtime, it's a time of blossom. It's a time of uh, blooming. It's a growing time, a youthful time of growing. Uh, Spring is always usually considered in a beautiful way, just like young children are always considered in a beautiful way. Um, I follow friends that have children on Facebook and just these little infants and their precious nature and kids as they grow up. Uh, there's just an excitement and there's a vitality to those earliest of years and an innocent beauty to them as well. The writer of Ecclesiastes, who I believe to be Solomon, says this in chapter 12, verse 1. He said, remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Here the writer is saying, seize the moment of your youth. And when he says, remember your creator, he's not saying, oh yeah, I forgot, you better remember him. But he's saying here, in the use of the word remember, is establish an identity with God when you're young, and the younger the better. Because he's saying here in verse 1, you're going to get to a point in time where you don't care for a whole lot of things. A lot of times people think, well, when I retire, then I'm going to get real serious about God, and I'm just going to serve him with a vitality, I'm going to be doing everything from morning till night. When, when I retire, the truth is when we get older, we're kind of winding down. We're not interested in new things. We're not interested in doing a lot of things that involve physical exertion. And we kind of get a little closed and a little bit of a tunnel vision about how we see life. And 
doing something different or new probably will not be the feature of our older years. So Solomon says here, seize the moment when you're young. Connect with God. Make sure He is at the foundation of your life before you get to the point where it doesn't really matter a whole lot if you don't have it already. There's not mass conversions among people my age, but there are in the ages of younger people. Because that's when someone will entertain new things and will take in things and soak them in. The Apostle Paul, in writing to uh, the young preacher Timothy, he says this in that chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, uh, verse, verses 14 and 15. 2 Timothy uh, 3, 14 and 15. He, he points Timothy back to his early years when his mother and his grandmother, who are cited in the first chapter, verses 3 through 5, Eunice and Lois, we talked about them just briefly last week, but he goes back to them without saying their names, and he speaks to the identity his mother and grandmother established in him from the earliest of years. Look at verse 14, 2 Timothy 3. He says, but as for you, and that's Timothy, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. Verse 15 now. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. First of all, Paul tells Timothy, continue in what you've learned. He says, go back to something that was taught you years ago. And Timothy was relatively young, probably in his 20s at this point, um, I'd guess, just on base what Scripture says. So he says, continue in what you've learned, Timothy, and you've become convinced of. That is, as he's grown in life, he's been able to do his own examination. He's not some brainwashed child that just grows up with the religion of his parents and just does what he's always been told to do. But he arrived at the point of being personally convinced the things he was taught when he was younger are true. And that a lot of times happens in your 18 to 25 year age span. You do your own investigation. You want to kind of break free, but if you've been taught solid things, a lot of times people go back to them unless they want to go off to another lifestyle, they go back to him. Yeah, that was right. I looked at it myself. So he says, uh, continue in what you've learned, become convinced of, because you know those, he's pointing to people now, that's his mother and grandmother, from who you learned it. His father was not a believer. We know that from the book of Acts about chapter 16. Father not a believer, but his mother and grandmother determined they were going to make sure he knew about the one true God and the scriptures that revealed him. You know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures from uh, which are able to make you wise. His mother and grandmother did not start when he was 10. They realized the most precious years of a person's life are the earliest years. And they started probably before he could read. I don't know how exactly the Greek word infancy works its way out, but the translators thought infancy was the right word in English to capture for what the Greek word is here. But basically, he's saying, you learn from your earliest years a knowledge of God and how to respect Him. Little kids can learn. They're like little sponges running around. They're willing to soak things in. They're willing to listen. They tend to listen to adults and trust them, not very long, so you better make your, your words quick with them because they're going to be going on to other things, but they will listen because they don't have a whole lot to crowd things out. And if you're a loving, caring person in their life, uh, uh, they trust your words the most. So parents uh, value everything you communicate to your children because they will be listening even if it doesn't appear that you have their attention. They will be listening. Uh, Paul tells children in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Uh, clearly believing they are capable of being obedient to their parents and learning um, what they ought to do. Well, how do you do that with little kids? A lot of times, well, you can hear it going on behind us. There's training going on of little, we got to hear a lot of little voices sing uh, last Sunday. But... Uh, 
littlest kids, they love to sing. And they love that song, This Little Light of Mine, and they know it, twisting that finger around. They, they can communicate with that, and did not Jesus teach in Matthew 5, we're to be the light of the world. So they're learning a biblical principle, but they're learning it in a way that they can connect to, that is through song. And teaching children songs and singing with them, parents, and, and anyone that's ever taught a Bible class is an invaluable thing to instill, especially through music, because music helps words stick. Children learn. I remember learning growing up. My mother would read Bible story books to us. Uh, she didn't attempt to read the King James Version of Leviticus to us, but she could pick out a Bible story book that had pictures in it, which I can, I can remember those pictures to this day. Uh, the walls of Jericho falling and just being, whoa. And her reading that, but yet in a simplified, paraphrased form that me and my sister and brother and I could understand at seven years old or, or six or earlier even. And there's Bible story books written for all ages, even the youngest, where the youngest of children can learn about the Lord because that is what that springtime is for. You're not doing a whole lot in 0 to 13. You're not uh, finding a cure for cancer necessarily. You're not sending someone to the moon, but you can learn. And we learn best when we're younger because the older we get, we tend to resist new things because we think we have it down now. Learn when you're younger. I want to look at an example. Look back, if you can navigate back to your Old Testaments, to the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 34. I want to show the value of learning when you're young. 2 Chronicles 34. Take your time to get there. I'm having to go a little slow myself, just getting there. Chapter 34. Uh, if you're not familiar with this book at all, um, the word chronicle, if you get the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, kind of understand the idea of what's in this book. It's, it's a historical record. The book of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles are historical records of the biblical nation of Israel. During the time from Saul, David, and Solomon, but especially in the latter years of this nation, where they had different kings of both the northern and the southern kingdom, and some of those kings were faithful to God. They served him in great ways, Hezekiah and others. There's others that just went the opposite direction. And usually the way the king went, the way the nation went. They had a good king, they served God faithfully. If they had a bad king, the kingdom of Judah or Israel went south. But here's an example of a good king starting very young. 2 Chronicles chapter 34, just the first few verses, uh, verses 1 through 3. It says, Josiah, verse 1, was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right, or to the left. Verse 3, in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still, what? Still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. In the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, Asherah poles, and idols. Under his direction, verse 4, the altars of the Baals, that's the idols, were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles and the idols. These he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. We'll just stop here. Um, he's purging the nation of Israel from all this idolatry that they'd been engaged in. And he's doing so at 16 years old. But notice he became king at what age? Eight years old. Now, I don't think he'd been to king school. He basically was appointed early, not knowing a whole lot, but his life did have the right direction. It says he did what was right, verse 2, in the eyes of the Lord. He followed in the ways of his father, David. This would be a spiritual father. David was a spiritual father of the nation of Israel. But basically, he's connecting to someone of Israel's past. And he's saying, this is a life I want to choose. And most likely he saw that life modeled by the adults around him, most likely his family. But he learned about God enough at age 8 that he kept the course. And when he turned 16, when most are living a wild life, probably of his generation, 
he decides he's going to serve God and purge Judah of everything that's destructive, everything that is destructive to them. I don't know too many 16-year-olds are doing that, but he was. Because he had learned about the Lord early in his life. Last night I went to a, a Christian music presentation. It was uh, singing of Phil Wickham, uh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel's led us in two of the great songs that he's written. He's a young songwriter, uh, younger I should say, and he was leading about 3,000 people in song of some of the most beautiful praise songs written today. And as I was standing there singing, I, I saw some families there, four or five, and the mother and father together were singing along. And a little girl, probably around six, seven years old, was kind of, their seats were just like ours. She was standing up on the seat so she could see the singers up on the stage. And she was singing along. The mother and dad were just singing along, not paying a whole lot of attention to her, but she was standing there just singing. Her hands were together. I thought, what a beautiful scene. I looked around at times, I saw others. I saw teenagers, five teenage boys singing along together, sitting right next to each other. I've never seen that. I've seen five teenage boys getting in trouble and in the dean's office many times. But I've never seen five teenage boys singing together, praising their God. What a beautiful scene. Someone taught them early in life. Someone taught them in early in life. That is the time to learn about the Lord, ideally. You need to learn later in life, you do it. But if you can start early. And I want to say this before I leave this point. Audrey and Oliver, you are greatly blessed to have parents that bring you to church, that care about the things of the Lord. Uh, there's kids that would love to go at, to church at times. They, or they wish later in life they had people that would take them, value what you have. And I preach you, uh, you guys being here, being the only kids. And that's how strong you guys are. And everyone else here notices that. Keep it up. You guys are doing great as young people. Here's our second season, summer. It's a time to respect the Lord. Ages 14 through 21. Uh, Paul told Timothy to teach, I'm, I'm sorry, Paul said to children in Ephesians 6, 1, you obey your parents, for it is right in the Lord. Um, when you're 14 through 21, that admonition continues, assuming you're still living at home. If you're not living at home, um, you can take charge of your own life, for better or for worse, but, uh, but when you're still at home, you still have this responsibility of obeying your parents. Uh, Paul didn't say when you feel like it or when you agree to it or when you sat down with your parents and worked out all the rules and make sure you mutually agree. He says, just do it. And he says, for it's right and so that you will live long upon the earth. But I will say, and again, I'm going back to younger people, it's a challenge when you're 14 through 21 because that's when you're wanting to learn things yourself and you're kind of not wanting to always be under the tutelage of your parents and being told what to do, and it is hard. And it's going to get harder, Audrey, to try to, try to go along because your, your own mind is developing. You're wanting to make your own decisions. So there's a healthy struggle between parents ages 14 through 21 and their children. There probably should be. You don't want children walking around like zombies just going along with mom and dad. There, there should be a little healthy tension. But there should, should still be respect and obedience. So continue to respect. That's what 14 and 21 through 21 ought to do. Continue to respect authority figures and parents. The authority figures would be teachers, law enforcement, people that you work for. If you learn respect for God and your parents early in life, you will respect other authority figures. But there's some that all their life struggle with anyone telling them what to do. And their life suffers because of that. But here someone learns to respect God during this time period. And that was what was so valuable last night, seeing what I knew was 14 to 16 year old boys clearly, respectfully praising God and there wasn't a parent around them. I couldn't even figure out how they got there. But they were there singing to their God. I thought, what a great age to be doing that. Here's what the Apostle Paul told Titus to teach. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus is right next to Timothy. Uh, we looked at this just briefly, I believe, last week. Titus speaks to different, I'm sorry, Paul tells Titus to speak to different age groups as he teaches the churches there in Crete. And he says in verse 6 to Titus, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. 
In everything, set an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those opposed you may not be ashamed, uh, or may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Look what younger men are told. They're told simply to be self-controlled. Ages 14 through 21, the summer of life, when things are solid, when things are going forward, you're trying to chart a course for your life. Paul says to Titus, there's one thing that young men need to be told. Be told to be self-controlled. Rein in your passions. Rein in a desire to be wild and go out and break the law and do things you ought not to do. Paul tells Titus, make sure that younger men especially learn to be self-controlled, which means learning how to say no when someone tries to pass some illegal substance to you. Alcohol. Some kind of sexual passion. To say no to that and go the opposite direction. To know when to get out of places or to know when to get away from people that are taking you the wrong direction. Teach them self-control. Paul tells Titus. That's a true respect to the Lord where you're doing it on your own versus doing it because your parents have told you to do it. Earlier in verse 5, younger women are taught to be self-controlled, pure, busy at home, and to be kind. A young woman can learn to respect God and to respect others instead of growing up to be a mean girl that knows how to say hurtful things to other people or a gossip or someone who's really good at talking down to others. Instead, as a young woman learns to use her advanced communication skills to encourage and to be kind and to say things that someone needs to build them up. I know students like that. And they're a treasure to their friends. Their friends trust them. Their friends want to be with them. Paul tells Titus, make sure the young women are taught to be kind. That's a respect to the Lord at ages 14 through 21. Develop faith and priorities. Look at 2 Chronicles 26 quickly. We'll do, we're going back and forth to these Old Testament texts because they provide examples. Uh, chapter 24. Let's make that 26. This is another king, not Josiah, but Uzziah this time, but also in his younger years did great things. Verse 1, 2 Chronicles 26, Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. He was the one who rebuilt Elath and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his ancestors. Verse 3, Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jekaloya, and she was from Jerusalem. Verse 4 now. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. Verse 5. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. Josiah served 31 years. Uzziah here 52 years. If you know the book of 2 Kings and 1 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles, the kings that lasted the longest were the ones that sought God. There's some that only lasted two years, some a few months. But those who sought out God in their younger years, their teen years, were given a long life as God promised, and were a great leader to their people. And notice here the father Amaziah is mentioned. Uzziah followed faithfully as the father had done. Chris, never underestimate the value of your example to your precious kids. and Them seeing you and taking them to church and, and being an example of working hard and just, that's invaluable. You can take it from a teacher who sees what happens when kids don't have that. Precious to learn respect for God at ages 14 through 21. The next one, fall. Establish following the Lord, ages 21 through 55. Going back to 1 Timothy, in chapter 4, verse 11. And Timothy is probably in his 20s here. 
Paul tells Timothy in chapter 4, verse 11, command and teach these things. And he says, verse 12, I remember hearing this a lot growing up. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Just pause here. Anyone remember how the King James says that? Don't let anyone despise your youth. <laughs> Don't look anyone look down upon you. Don't let anyone look down upon you when you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through, the prof through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Verse 15 now. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Verse 16. Paul tells Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will both save yourself and your hearers. Here Paul is telling Timothy, be solid in what you believe. He first says, don't let anyone look down upon you when you're, just because you're young. A lot of times with young people in this age bracket, especially the early 20s, there's a lot of reason to look down upon them. It's a time to go to college to get wasted and do sexually immoral things. It's a time to live a profligate lifestyle because you want to live it up. You're no longer living in your parents' home usually and, and you just want to do and you go away to college, you go away somewhere and you just want to do what you want to do and if the evil one gets a hold of that, it'll be an absolute embarrassment. But here Paul tells Timothy, that doesn't have to be you. Don't let anyone look down upon you when you're young. But he says... Let your life speak for itself. He says, be an example to the believers in speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. In other words, he's telling Timothy, don't be known for telling crude jokes or telling bathroom style humor. Instead, watch your speech, your conduct. Act in a responsible, honorable way, not in an embarrassing way where your mom and dad would just shudder to think what they just learned. He says, Make sure that you're strong in love and faith too. It's not just being this rigid Christian that he's calling Timothy to be, but be someone who's known for their love and care for other people. For purity, for faith, for having a genuine faith. That's what should embody someone ages 21 through 55. You've kind of set the table for your life when you're 21. You've grown up ideally learning and soaking in good things. You've learned to make your own decisions in your late teen, uh, late teen years. But when you're in your 20s and you're, you're away from home and you're setting the course of your life when you're, you're, you're establishing a career, you're making decisions for your family, those should be the years in which you're becoming very solid. So Paul tells Timothy, protect your life, develop it. Be a leader, he's saying. He says, verse 15 to Timothy, Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone will see your progress. Not your weakness. So that everyone see, will see your progress. He says, verse 16, Watch your life and your teaching closely. Make sure that your personal conduct matches what you're saying from the pulpit. Make sure people are seeing a consistent message, he's saying. Live out what you know to be true. That's what should be true of ages 21 through 55. That doesn't mean you have it all together and you never do anything wrong, but you kind of know what life's all about in that time frame. You're not trying to figure it out at age 43. You figured it out. And now it's living it out, which will always be a challenge, but at least you know what life is all about and you're choosing that in this time period. Look back again. Maybe you've learned to kind of keep your place in 2 Chronicles. I haven't. I'm going all the way back again. 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 34, verse 8. I want to see again one of these kings as his life gets older and enters this time span. 2 Chronicles 34, verse 8. Here, again, it's Josiah, and the writer is making time references according to his age. 
And he says in verse 8, in the 18th year of Josiah's reign, which would be, make him 26, in the 18th year of Josiah's reign, to purify the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, the son of Eliza and Messiah, the ruler of the city, with Joah, the son of Jehoahaz, the recorder, to repair the temple of the Lord his God. So at 26, you find Josiah not in Vegas at the tables, but instead he's saying, hey, we need to repair God's temple. And he gets a bunch of people together. He's become this young leader because he started when he was eight years old, started doing really good things at age 16, and sure enough, now at 26, he's doing great things. Leading other men to restore the temple which had fallen into neglect during these abysmal years when Israel did not follow God. What 26-year-old do you know does that? It's someone who has a deep faith for God and what's important to God. Following the Lord consistently ought to be the hallmark of ages 21 through 55. This is the fall when things should be solid before winter comes. Because winter is coming, so fall needs to be solid in your life. And here is winter. It's time to share the Lord. I consider winter ages 56 and beyond. You might say, John, where are you getting those years? I don't know. Just, I just noticed in my life, this, <laughs> get 56, I started feeling a little wintry. And I couldn't do the things I could do when I was older, and I thought different and things like that. There's things for every generation. In the book of Titus, here's what Titus says to the older men and women. Or Paul tells Titus to teach, I'm sorry. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Here you've kind of arrived when you entered this period of life. Not arrived on stage like, look at me. That's not the arrival that God's looking for. But you've kind of lived a little bit. You've experienced life's ups and downs. You've learned from sinful choices as have I. You have a better way of looking at life than you did when you were 20. You can see sinful things from afar off where when you're younger you got far too close to things and perhaps fell into something sinful. Now you can see it coming on its train far away. You can see the evil one a lot easier when you're in this time period of life. So Paul tells the older men and the older women, that they ought to be self-controlled. They ought to reflect their age. Instead of running around all loosey-goosey and trying to live like a 20-year-old, he says, hey, be someone respectful. Be someone that when they look at you or they listen to you or when you talk about things, they, they want to listen for the right reasons. Not because you have some kind of People Magazine gossip, but because you have something good to say, something uplifting, uh, something wise to share. Let that be the hallmark of these winter years. Again, winter doesn't mean you're done. Winter means you have a lot to give, but just not a few years, or I'm sorry, just not a lot of years to give it. But you have a lot to give. Winter years are not the time to stay inside and be all locked up and not want to engage with people. Here you have a lot to give. Uh, when he tells the older men, hey, be sound in faith, love, and endurance, someone needs to see that. He doesn't say be sound in faith, love, and endurance all locked up in your house. But be engaged with the world. Find ways to volunteer and interact with younger people. That's the idea where your light truly can shine, as you sang when you were six years old. Let that light be seen. Uh, the older women here, to be kind, to teach what is good. If you're going to teach what is good, you have to be in relationship with someone. You don't have to be standing up here. You can just be talking, uh, talking at Denny's and teaching just by sharing things you learned when you were younger. 
So Paul tells those in the winter of life to be an example. Share advice when needed, which is all the time. <laughs> that doesn't mean you sit down to every young person you find and say, well, let me tell you how it is. Let me tell you the way we did it. They say, hey, I, I know you're struggling. Let me tell you what I went through when I was 17. And let me tell you about my 20s. And unless you go on way too long, younger people are going to want to listen. Because humanity never changes even though time changes. And though the decades in our culture have changed and the 50s are, were different than the 60s, 70s, 80s, and now people have never changed. People still want to love and be loved. People still want to be successful. They still want to do things. They still learn things the hard way. They still make mistakes. And if you as someone who's in a seasoned point of life can share those with younger people, what a blessing you are to their life. You can be a trusted adult. I want to look one final time at 2 Chronicles chapter 34, but now verse 33. We're going back to Josiah. Because the writer wants us to know how he lived his life from age 8 all the way up to the end. Verse 33, chapter 34. The writer says, Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the territory belonging to the Israelites. And he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. As long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Let me just read that verse again. Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the territory belonging to the Israelites. And he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. As long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors. So as long as he was around, other people were blessed. And if you're older, don't think that you're done or no one's listening or everyone's just passing you by. You've got a wealth of knowledge even if it's from the school of hard knocks. Even if it's from the school of, I wish I'd done that different. Man, evil one says, yeah, yeah, I wish you had, but God says, hey, look what you learned. And look at the grace I'm showing you now. Young people need to know how to get back up when they fall. They need to see that others have made the same mistakes, but then what to do once you've made them. And that's where older people can be a great blessing. You can be what we call in the schools a trusted adult. Many times when kids go through difficult times in the schools uh, and they've had a hard time and they come back to school, they have a meeting called a re-entry meeting. And the administrators ask them, who are the trusted adults here at school? That is, if you're having a hard time again, who can we go to to maybe call in next time you might be in a bad place? That's an honored position to be a trusted adult. The school has set uh, 200 adults to be one, or, one of maybe two people that a teenager will say, well, that's my trusted adult. One I believe will tell me the truth. Will be straight up with me, as the kids say. And that I can trust being around. If you're older, that can be you. On your street, with grandchildren, kids you interact with in the community that you've gotten to know in different ways and different avenues. That can be you, a trusted adult. You can't buy that at a store. You can be Bill Gates, but you can't buy being a trusted adult. You have to have lived a little bit and you earn that. To be trusted as an adult. And usually it's once you're older. Recognize as we conclude that every season of life is valuable. Don't waste one of the seasons. But I know as I conclude, if you're like myself, there's times in these seasons where you wish you'd done a lot of things different. If you wish things had been different in 0 through 13, if you missed those things in the earliest years, you can catch up. If you wish you'd learned things from 0 to 13 that you learn later in life, you can still keep learning. You can still be a sponge. You can still take in things. 
If you wish you'd done things different, ages 14 through 21, and you wasted some years, you can start now. You can start making choices now, wherever you're at, that honor God. Ages 21 through 55, you, you weren't as solid as you wish you had become. If you were misdirected in your priorities, you can become redirected. You can always be redirected and come back to being solid or start being solid. There's never a point in time where you can't be what you ought to be anymore. No matter how many years you wish you'd done things differently, you can start right now going forward. You can't change the past. And don't live there because God's not living there anymore with you. But go forward and ask, what will I do now, in age 56 and beyond, if you're unsure about what you can contribute as an older Christian, just be sure you have value. And pray to God for opportunities to send people in situations your way where you can be a blessing. And God will do that. To make sure you recognize them when they come your way. When those kids are on your lawn, don't be the person that says, get off my lawn! But said, hey... Let me talk to you. Hey, sit down. I love this lawn. Let's all sit down together. Be that kind of older adult, and you'll be treasured. You'll be treasured. Seize the moment of your life. Grow in your season, and be all that God intends for you to be. We're going to sing a song now to, uh, chal to challenge us to do what we know we ought to do, and to leave these doors in just a moment, different people, when we get in the car, when we drive, when we go home, when we interact with friends and neighbors and family, to be different than we were at 9.55. To keep going forward. To keep growing. Let's stand and sing this song as Nathaniel leads us.